Hi everyone, it's Jerry. We had a very rare matchup in chess in the 77th Tata Steel Chess Tournament 2015. Two current world champions competing. On the white end, the current world chess champion and world number one Magnus Carlsen against the current women's world chess champion and world number 70, Yi Fan Ho. Let's have a look at it. We had uh, Magnus opening up with e4. This game here turned out to be quite the positional struggle. E fan replying with the Sicilian. We get to see an open Sicilian with d4. After e5 and d6, we have more specifically the Kalashnikov variation. With now c4, it's at this stage we can already identify a couple key squares, weak squares in the position. D4 is weak for white, D5 for black, weak because neither side's pawns can now control those squares. Following up, we have bishop e7. There's a reason to delay knight f6, that'll be revealed shortly. But first, more development, knight c3. Black gives that knight a kick. Bishop e6 and knight, d knight to c2 do similar, watching over those weakened squares. And now bishop g5, welcoming a dark square bishop exchange, a bad bishop for a good bishop. And this is a, uh, a good idea. Not only for, not only related to bad bishop, good bishop exchange, but also related to, uh, white having more space, uh, seeing some peace exchanging, having, having a minor peace exchange is a welcome sight for black. These guys here are a bit cramping to the black position, not allowing any uh, pawn breaks so easily. So we have bishop to e2, avoiding this exchange with knight e3 while well, he had a job to watch over d4. You really can't avoid that exchange, and you really can't try and win a pawn like this, because at the end of the day, your queen is going to be won. If you move the queen, you're getting mated. So you just have to allow that exchange... And there's some time invested with that, but again, uh, I think it's a good exchange. I think it's time well spent. You'll notice that bishop took, what, three moves to capture a piece that moved not at all. But uh, at, in the end, I think it is worthwhile to do so. So getting on with more development, knight f6, both sides castle, queen d2. Just getting all pieces working, queen b6. You could take this pawn, but you'll drop b2. That's not such a healthy exchange. He's probably the least healthy black pawn, and he's very important for white, the central pawn for the white queenside majority. So instead, it's getting the last piece involved, and black gets rook f to d8 in. This pawn cannot be taken because the queen would be trapped. So it's rook f d8, b3. c4 is now defended. Uh, by a pawn, so this bishop can do some other things. Both sides get a flight square in, the least committal flight square, not making any uh, permanent weaknesses with those moves. And following up, we have queen a7. This is freeing up maybe at some stage b5, but that's very difficult to get in with a pawn, knight, and bishop there controlling it. We have bishop f3 now, and so this is paving the way for a knight hop into the center. Doing so right away would drop e4. Knight takes e4 is there. So bishop f3, this is now a possibility. And black anticipates this with knight e7. Uh, getting in a position essentially to be able to capture on that square with the bishop and not have to react to some threat on the knight on that c6 square. So he gets out of harm's way. White never goes in for it, though. Instead, plays knight e3. You see what just happened there? There's a certain tension in this current position right here on that d4 square. These guys are essentially negating one another. They're boxing each other out. They're fighting for that d4 square. As soon as knight e7 is there, well, this knight now has a bit more freedom to maybe do other things. Knight e3. This, hop this happens quite a bit. Uh, not in this game, just generally speaking in chess, when there's a certain tension between pieces when they're fighting for particular squares. If one goes elsewhere, well, maybe the other can go elsewhere, and we see that take shape on this move 18. So black tries to get back to it. Knight c6, dropping into that d4 square. White has some other things in mind, looking to eliminate this bishop, 
If bishop takes bishop, well, now this starts to become all the more appealing, dropping into that weakened d5 square. Black has another thing in mind, allowing bishop takes bishop and now recapturing with the pawn. Doubled pawns, well, this is a very valuable pawn, watching over d5. And now this knight needs to be dealt with. It's the one piece in the white position that needs to be addressed. So the knight drops back to c2. And we have this particular knight exchange. This was an interesting moment. Um, the remaining pieces here, these four pieces, they um, there's a lot of maneuvering that goes on from here on out. And I wonder if it would have been better to keep yet another piece on board. Uh, and instead of capturing the knight, to play back to c6 and claim that uh, this knight is better placed than the uh, the one on c2. Still, you know, if he if he's to go elsewhere, he's very quick to drop right back into that d4 square. It's uh it's a tough call. I'm not completely sure about it, but my general feel for it is to drop back to c6 and just keep this possibility uh available. One other. A more technical way to maybe view it is if we look at the two knights here, the one on c6 is more secure in that it's defended by a pawn, whereas this knight here on c2 is defended by a piece, and those pieces may want to go elsewhere. At some stage, maybe he is tactically vulnerable. I'm not completely sure. Um, I don't see that in this current position, but you never know if the position is to open up at some stage. Maybe he's a bit more vulnerable being on C2, not protected by a pawn when compared to his counterpart on C6 who has some defense. It's just a thought uh, to keep one more piece on board or not. In the game, uh, Efan opts for a knight exchange, and we have from here on out a lot of maneuvering. Defense of d6, uh, also looking to maybe build up for a d5 break, but uh, that never happens. Uh, white isn't uh, allowing that so easily. This is an interesting rook lift. There's already an idea in mind with swinging the rook over to the g file. So rook d3, and only then uh, is this rook going to later come over to d2. After queen c5, knight a4, the queen has to react. And if this is an idea to come over to this g3 square, it's important with how you defend this pawn, of course. Uh, there might be the temptation to play f3 and just have a pawn watch over a pawn. But that's going to rule out not only a rook coming over here, but quick access uh, to the king side along this diagonal. Pawn interferes with both of those. So instead, it's for at least right now, rook e3, defending the e4 for a second time, b6, a little knight maneuver here, rook getting active, and after knight c5, knight e3, this is stopping knight here because knight takes e5, exploiting the pin on the d8 rook. So instead knight a5, this is stopping knight b4, a move that might be a bit uncomfortable if I'm to just make a passing move like rook f8. Knight b4 hits the queen, the pawn, and unleashes the rook on d6. So it's a5, and now this weakens b5. And so the knight is going to try to make use of that square. We have first knight b2. We could try knight a4 to c3, or even knight d1 to c3. Knight c5 stops knight a4, but the knight goes in the other direction. Repositioning. Getting into that c3 square, black is putting pressure with that last move on f2. To rook f8, it's defended with queen to e1, rook is there to defend. Rook comes back. It's difficult to suggest something for black here. White is slowly making some progress here. What's happening here is a, with this little knight dance or knight maneuver here, is that he's going to be really well placed soon on the c3 square. Now that this pawn is more secure with a minor piece in a rook, that means the queen is now freed up to do some other things. Black hits over there to secure d6. Queen to d1. Again, these pawn breaks in the position are all under control. 
Queen d1 arriving back at her home square is now looking to jet out to that h5 square. Knight, H, knight a6, queen h5. Knight c7, rook g3. And we're going to slowly have the doubling on the g-file. That's what white is preparing. Again, none of this would be possible if this pawn was on that f3 square trying to defend e4 earlier. He needed this square open, the f3 square open, for all of these heavy pieces to try and stir up some trouble against the black king. You'll notice after rook to g3, this was a threat. King h8 gets out of that. Uh, queen takes h6 move. Rook on d to d3. Rook e7. We have the doubling happening right here. Rook d7, another reposition with the knight. He's now trying to inch closer towards the black king. Maybe g4 and then crashing through on h6. Rook f7, you have to be very careful here. It's uh, very aggressive pieces here on the white side, but if you're not careful, just having a couple uh, piece exchanges uh, can turn the tables a bit. The follow-up here is queen e2, but how natural would it be to just simply want to drop your knight right into e3? That was the intention, wasn't it? You go to d1. Why is white not following through with an immediate knight to e3? Well, the reason is because of h uh, rook to f6, Welcome, welcoming some exchanges here. You can't take on f6 because you're dropping the queen, and so this is going to uh, make some. This is going to force some exchanges, and black will have uh, no problems defending the king. I mean, what are, you, what are you going to do here? Queen g4, rook takes, queen takes, queen takes. This rook is a bit clumsy, right? He's a bit out of play. The, the black king is much quicker to contribute to control in the center, and uh, maybe this is now not going to be so long off. He's misplaced if there's too many peace exchanges. So white anticipates this move, and that's why we don't have knight e3, but rather a queen move. Queen to e2, getting out of that. Rook f4, keeping pressure on, or entering the white position and keeping pressure on e4. Maybe not allowing this uh, move so easily now, right? Interfering with the queen's defense. So it's queen e3, throwing a punch at b6, b5. Knight b2 is there to defend. This would be a very welcome sight to capture like this. You could be recapturing with the knight or even the pawn here. The knight would really like to get to this d3 square and kick the rook out of there. And that is the main intention here. Knight b2 looks to get into this d3 square, hits the rook, puts pressure on this pawn. There's even ideas of undermining the black center with c5. Having a knight on d3 is quite powerful. So black doubles, hitting at f2. This could be ignored. c5 now undermines this black center. This position is starting to open up, and white is the side who is benefiting having a better placed knight. He's very clumsy on c7, and this is a rook that has a great deal of depth. Pressure on this 6th rank, pressure on that uh, h6 square more specifically. There's some tricks uh, not long off here. Queen c5. If you're capturing this pawn, knight d6, or knight d3 is a killer. Just hitting everything. This is going to crumble fast. So instead, queen c6, knight d3, and b4. So this rook could be taken. Some time was spent on this. About uh, about eight minutes was spent. You could capture this rook at this point here, but instead, uh, white goes for something else. Queen to e2, uh, not capturing that rook. If you capture the rook right away, there is this fork. But you do have the move queen f3, and so if pawn takes, you're getting the rook right back. But I don't know that this is uh, a, a good option here. You have queen takes c5 and then rook here. You could even do moves like this. If there's some exchanges, again, these rooks, if enough material is exchanged, uh, one of the rooks can find themselves just out of play. There will be no more attack against the king, and the attention will turn in a different section of the board on the queen side. Just to emphasize one point here, if you're exchanging queens, usually a good idea when you're up material, how do you stop that pun? Um, 
So we, we're not going in for this exchange. First is queen e2. Now maybe this is on. Rook to h4. This is stopping the queen from entering h5, not allowing this uh, queen h5 move. There could be some serious issue if that's played, just making a move here such as knight b5. Queen here is already threatening some uh, stuff on this h6 square. So rook h4 is interfering with this. Following up rook g4, rook takes, queen takes. This queen is now very active. This rook is tethered to the defense of g7. This pawn could never move, and white is very close to uh, just snipping that pawn and then crashing through on d6, but needs some more uh, pressure on e5 before uh, pulling the trigger on that capture. King to g8, queen h5. And after knight b5, we have rook g4. So this is getting out of the way of some uh, possibility for a knight e2 uh, fork against the rook and the king. Following up, we have knight c3. Queen takes h6. Is there a better defense against this right here? Not really. Uh, if you're getting out of the pin with king to f8, this is going to collapse by way of c takes d, knight takes d, and, well, this point is collapsing right here. Doesn't matter how you, how you look at it, this knight is going to be dropping in here, not just winning a pawn, but improving his position and doing so with tempo. It's not really a great defense here of queen takes h6. So we have knight c3, queen takes h, knight takes e, and now queen takes e6, and this is really just crumbling. This rook is in a pin. Knight takes e5 is on board, exploiting the pin against the queen. And what's tried is knight f2, knight takes e5, and uh, one last try, knight takes h3. But after king h2, this is game over. It's at this point that uh, black resigns. Uh, the only thing that white needed to watch out for is this capture here, or I should say capturing the knight will allow queen takes c, and there's just a, this is just a direction not to go in at all. Um, white king is in big trouble actually. So just one calm move here to finish up king h2, and there's no defense here. Again, you can't take the knight, although that's the top suggestion by the computer, to take the knight and then give up the queen. Doing something other than that, such as queen b7 to defend the rook, is already running into a mate in 6, starting with knight g6, looking for this stuff here. And if the back rank is now defended, don't forget about this either. So there's just not going to be a good solution at this point. Um, and again, after king to h2, it's at that point that uh, black resigned. So a uh, very interesting game, uh, uh, a unique game for sure, to have two world champions going at it. Quite the positional struggle out of the uh, open Sicilian, the Kalashnikov variation, a reason to not go with that quick knight f6, getting the bad bishop for good bishop exchange, some time invested with that, but time well spent. Uh, especially since we had such a maneuvering game, such a fairly closed position, time not such a great element. And this tension here, this is an important detail, sometimes when one knight moves here, if there's certain tension between pieces, when one knight moves, maybe the other one's going to be uh, a bit more optimistic. Maybe he has uh, different ideas in mind. Maybe he could do some other things if uh, if your opponent's knight is going elsewhere. A lot of maneuvering in this one. D5 was repaired. The decision to capture the knight or not, I'm not so sure. Uh, feel free to share some feedback on this particular exchange. Uh, I can't be completely sure, but uh, I maybe got something from some of those thoughts that I shared there. And eventually not playing F6. That was an interesting point here, not defending like so. As soon as the knight arrived on that C3 square for white, now we started to have these major pieces drift over towards that black king. And you have to be careful with your attack. Queen e2 avoids too many exchanges. And eventually this knight on d3 became intolerable. Too much pressure, the undermining of the black center. And this is where it's really starting to collapse. The white knight was certainly the more dominant one 
and finally avoiding one last trick, king h2, and that's going to seal the deal there. So a very interesting game. I hope you enjoyed it. And as always, I hope you got something out of this video. Take care. Bye.